We'll trade horse for sex. Welcome to Wild True, the podcast of your wildest memes. We're your one-stop internet culture shop here to dissect what's going viral, why we care, and how this might affect our real human lives. I'm your- I put gentle minion here, but now I don't want to say that. That's all I've got, Isabel. And I'm Amanda, who just shut off her AC through her phone because she realized that the AC would interfere with the recording. Anyone could be famous on the internet, so why not us? Look at all the sacrifices that Amanda is making for the podcast. Being hotter, physically mentally spiritually emotionally speaking of us being hot and thus um, <laughs> going on dates because we're both hot um, I have to grill you so in our real personal lives where we are real actual friends you told me that you went on a date and you went to see a movie why did you not see the minion movie damn I'm being put on blast like you know up front man okay so I obviously I didn't go see the minion movie with this guy because I have to go see the minion movie with you yes Okay, honestly, perfect answer. Listen, like, could not have answered the question better. Bros before hoes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And why are we going to see the Minion movie? What's what's the meme? For those who are not on TikTok and or live under a rock and or are my mom who listens to the podcast. <laughs> Specifically for Amanda's mom. We will explain it. The current meme around the Minions, because I think there's something about the Minions that just spawns memes related to them. Like, I, I do oh, think yeah. like, they, they have that special sauce of people will be so weird about it, but in ways that are actually very annoying. The current meme is basically like groups of teenage boys dressing up in suits and going to see the minions and this is called the gentle minions trend <laughs> yeah and it's like just like these tiktok videos where they're playing a song in the background from the minion soundtrack and it's like 30 tickets to the minion movie please and it's just like 30 teenage boys like wearing sunglasses and suits mm -hmm. just like walking toward the camera like we're coming to see the minions and it's so funny. Like, it's such a good meme. I love it. It's so funny because also, okay, so other things that they do with these TikToks is like, they will look so incredibly serious about going to see the Minions as if it is a piece <laughs> of fine art. And like, in unison. Another thing that some of them did, and this is where we go into the, oh, the meme is maybe being taken too far. So one of the variants was that I saw was that there was a bunch of teenage boys in suits, and then two teenage boys dressed as guys who were gonna go fix the bathroom. Bringing, you guessed it, garbage can filled with bananas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, so that part I don't get. Like, okay, the thing is, what's funny about, like, investigating internet culture stuff is that sometimes it's like, oh, this is a really deep callback to this very specific cultural moment, and you have to, like, understand the, like, five different things that got us here to this meme. And sometimes, like, I think in the case of Gentle Minions, it's just like, hey, it would be really funny if we did this. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything deeper here than Gentle Minions sounding funny, teenage boys wanting to fuck around, extremely funny to go see the Minions in a suit. Like, you know, it makes for good social media content. It makes for like a stupid little bit that you can do with your friends. I'm pro Gentle Minions, but I'm also anti people fucking up the theater because apparently what happened that is- That has happened. It has happened where now people, are, now teenage boys are being Band from wearing suits to the theater because they have <laughs> fucked up the theater a little bit. And, you know, that kind of tracks for groups of teenage boys. Yeah, and I mean, it's like, okay, like, the meme gets taken too far when there's, like, parents there with their children just trying to see a movie and you're, like, doing a flash mob in front of the screen and throwing bananas at the screen. <laughs> If I was a six-year-old whose mom took me to see the Minions and I saw a bunch of teenage boys in suits throwing bananas, that would immediately become a core memory. Yeah, I don't I don't know how I would react if I were a six-year-old and saw that happening. I think I would be very confused. Like, that's a core memory. Yeah, for sure. I mean, these kids, they're getting core memories. And so, I mean, I did see that someone argued Ryan Broderick in the Garbage Day newsletter, which is a good newsletter for, like, going too deep on the internet. He argued that the 30 Tickets to the Minions movie construction is a callback to a meme from a couple years ago where it was like really like schlubby guys and fedoras who can't dress themselves. And it was like, four tickets to the Joker, please. But I don't know. I mean, I think it's just like funny. I could see the referent I don't know if I believe that's where it comes from. But that being said, who can say? I actually don't know where the ground zero of the Gentle Minions meme is coming from. That's the thing. I mean, this might just be me being lazy and not having gone far enough down the research hole. Mm -hmm. But I really think this is a case of just like a teenage boy being like, 
wouldn't it be funny if we dressed up in suits? I did read an interview with one of the originators of the trend who was like, yeah, we just thought this would be funny. Yeah, and and they were right. It's very funny. We're turning into a movie podcast, but specifically about movies we haven't seen. You know, I do think this is like, (laughs) there's no niche for this, but movie podcast specifically about meme movies. That's nothing. That's just our podcast. I feel like there's not enough meme movies. I I mean, there kind of is. Like, you could get into like, Airbud, Like, I feel like Airbud's a meme movie. I think anything that the Disney Channel put out between the years 2000 and 2010 could be argued as a meme movie. You ever think about Luck of the Irish? He was just a leprechaun. <laughs> I didn't see that one. I just, I don't know. I feel like the core of every Disney movie, including High School Musical, like, there are so many movies that were like, I like sports, but I also like another thing. Help. That's what it's like being 12. To be sincere for, like, two minutes, I think that that sort of movie works well for kids slash, like, young teenage demographics, because that's kind of the age when you're t- figuring out liking things. Does that make yeah. sense? Like, when, when you start, <laughs> no, like, I'm dead serious. It's like, oh, yeah. I have interests. And sometimes I feel weird about having interests. I'm right. You are right. Like, I don't know. Like, I remember there was a movie where it was like, they were on a baseball team, but he was also a cook. And then he had to go to the cooking competition. Wait, I do was remember this. Time. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And it's like, why, why are all the extracurriculars scheduled at the same time? Okay, that's accurate to real life. True, true, true. I mean, yeah, I was not able to do um, AP Spanish because it was this, it was at the same time as newspaper. Devastating. That's why now I've lost my Spanish speaking ability. But it's also why you're a journalist now. <laughs> So, you know, skill trees. Yeah, so where do you see Minions compared with Morbius? Because I think it's so funny that this happened back to back. Because on one hand, I think that the internet culture influence is concrete and there. On the other hand, I think maybe we overstated it a little bit. Like, I don't think that Minions is breaking records for the best performing July 4th movie release solely because of the Gentle Minions trend. But I do think it has helped. But also, I think it's just, like, Minions is a very popular franchise. But I do think that the TikTok trend is clearly having an impact. And then you have Morbius, where the internet culture aspect of it is, what if nobody saw Morbius? Whereas for Minions, it's, what if we all went to see Minions, but we're wearing a suit? And whether you're wearing a suit or not, you are selling tickets. (laughs) Unfortunately, you have contributed to capitalism. Yeah, I think it's funny to make a dichotomy of them because it's like, what if we don't see this movie versus what if we do see this movie? And I think what this actually speaks to is that brands trying to capitalize on meme trends, I don't think is going to mostly ever work out because it's like catching like lightning in a bottle, right? Like you don't know what the meme is going to become and whether it's going to be beneficial to you. And even things that seem like they're beneficial to you where like people are talking about it a lot are still like, well, the meme might be that nobody should go see this movie. And also I think, I mean, underpinning that, I think these are fundamentally different movies, like you said, right? Like Minions is just part of a long running franchise that a lot of people like and a lot of people like to dunk on. Whereas Morbius is Morbius. You know, he goes out there, yeah. he morbs on everyone. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the plot of the movie Morbius. You know, something, I mean, we've talked about the Morbius meme, like, extensively enough, but something I realized last night when I was trying to explain Morbius to a friend, because I wanted to just, like, I was making a Morbius joke. Oh, no, th- the joke was, because I-, I was at my friend's house last night, and, you know, as I do, I simply am just on their couch playing video games and then also scrolling through Twitter because I'm a horrible person. And I saw a tweet that was like, the Democratic Party is the same energy as when Sony re-released Morbius for a second <laughs> theatrical release. This is so true, though. And I was laughing at that tweet, and then my friend Dan was like, hey, what are you laughing at? And I was like, I read the tweet, and they were like, oh, I sat out the Morbius one and I was like, let me explain it to you. And they were like, no. And I was like, no, literally, I can explain it in like under a minute. And they were like, okay. And it's just like, the meme is so simple. It's just people thought it would be funny to not see a movie. And the meme is that nobody knows what happened because nobody has seen it. And then Sony re-released it, but then nobody saw it because the meme is that you don't see it. You know, the funny thing here is that by saying, I don't want to hear about the Morbius meme, (laughs) that's really participation above and beyond anything we've asked for for this Morbius meme, you know? Because it's like, I don't even need to know what the meta is. I don't even need to be here. Yeah, that's like the best way to participate in the meme of not seeing Morbius. (laughs) is not knowing knowing that it's a meme to not see Morbius. Okay, I'm kind of wondering at this point, do you think that the Morbius meme is not actually that funny anymore and we just think it's funny? (laughs) Because sometimes I worry about this. 
I think that our listeners like to see us having fun, and I think we're having fun, and I do think that it's interesting that the Morbius meme is very accessible, and I think so is Gentle Minions, because there's not that much more to it besides it's funny. Well, the Gentle Minions meme arguably participating it actually has a very high accessibility barrier, because you need to be a teenage boy with a lot of friends who can all be persuaded to wear a suit. (laughs) I can fulfill one of these categories. That you have a lot of friends who are teenage boys. Obviously, yes. (laughs) That would be weird. That no. would be very weird. Um, I don't know any teenage boys. Yeah, but I think there there is a low barrier to appreciating it. So speaking of how you can't really predict whether a brand can capitalize on the meme trend or whether it would backfire, have you seen Radio Shack's Twitter this week? Only what you've told me about it. So I know about Radio Shack's Twitter in the same way I know about Morbius. <laughs> That's truly incredible. So on June 29th at 1.18 p.m., the official Radio Shack Twitter, the hundred-year-old brand of, like, radio stuff, I guess? I don't know. <laughs> you... <laughs> well, they have a shack and it's filled with radios. So what's there not to get? Okay, also as an aside, I didn't even know that Radio Shack still existed. Oh, yeah. I mean, they closed the majority of their stores, but I think now they're trying to do, like, a crypto thing. I don't know. So Radio Shack tweeted, if you find a squirter, marry her. Radio Shack? Yeah, and it got 80,000 likes, uh, 16,000 retweets, 14,000 quote tweets. Well, yeah, because Radio Shack is horny tweeting now, so I guess we all need to know about it. Hmm. I don't like that. Yeah, I feel like it's just like, we're too far beyond this. Like, this isn't funny anymore. Like, regardless of like, let's not even unpack the content of the tweet. Like, let's, it's it's not about the content of the tweet. It's not about the squirting. <laughs> it's about- <laughs> It's just like, I feel like Steakums is the only brand that has done this in a funny way, and anyone who has come after Steakums can't oh, do come, this say? anymore. I'm sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <No. laughs> We're rated R, guys. It's fine. So Chris Stokel Walker wrote an article for Input Mag where he interviewed the chief marketing officer of Radio Shack, who is named Abel Supor. And it was basically just, like, an article about, like, hey, we talked to this guy to see what has gone on. And Radio Shack now has, like, 400 stores compared to 5,000 in 2014. And now there is Radio Shack Swap, a crypto exchange platform. And so... What this marketing officer said is, you really have to make an impression in order to basically get known with youngsters. (laughs) According to LinkedIn, this guy has only been with Radio Shack since April, but then he's also making the argument of like, oh, we want brands to be talking in the way that like you'd talk with your bros. That is... How old is this dude? Um, he declined to tell input how old he is. That's... Okay, so too old. Yeah. So like, like 50. I just... I don't really know what to do with this information, if that makes sense. Yeah. I feel like this is one of those things where, like, how did that tweet get past the levels of review to make it out into the world? Because he's the chief marketing officer. He is the level of review. I do think, God, I feel like at some some point during their, like, I don't really have anything funny to say about this. This is just an absurd thing for Radio Shack to be tweeting. Yeah. The quote is, we are just basically posting the kinds of things that some people will be talking about in private with their friends. Are you talking about squirters in private with your friends? I'm not talking about squirting in private with my friends, but now I wonder maybe maybe I should be. Maybe I'm the one that's not cool. (laughs) Yeah, are we behind on the times? But my favorite part about all of this is that this guy, like, throughout this article, you can't really tell whether he's being sincere or if this is just part of the elaborate bit. But he says, there are a lot of different takeaways in regard to, like, what it is, like, could this be a case study for, like, brands, whatever. And he says, I would ask about the idea of making deep research on this to someone at like Harvard. (laughs) Maybe this is part of his like five step plan. Step one, tweet about squirting. Step two, get written about tweeting about squirting. Step three, someone at like Harvard does a study about this. Step four, Radio Shack gets a 401st store. (laughs) (laughs) We did it, kids. We've solved Radio Shack. And speaking of sex related things that nobody wants to know about, Elon Musk being into eugenics. Yeah, that's that's objectively bad. But so, okay, so here's the thing about Elon Musk being into eugenics that I think is actually very funny is that he's going about <laughs> this in the most insane way possible. So like he'll say shit that's like vaguely eugenics-y, but also in his personal life, he's like, you know what I'm gonna do? 
I'm going to have so many secret babies. And it's like, bro, <laughs> how are these related? Why is this what you think is going to solve that? Like, if you think that's a problem, why is this your solution? Anyway, so here's what's going on. As I wrote here, Elon did not pull out and he has twins. This is the Elon secret baby gate too, where <laughs> I, I kind of, you know, I kind of assumed when we first talked about Elon having a secret baby that that was a one and done, right? Like, I was kind yeah. of like, yeah, okay, of course him and Grimes had an accidental secret baby, and of course Grimes failed to hide it. That does seem like something that would happen to Grimes. Well, I don't think it was accidental, because they had a secret baby via surrogate. Oh shit, was- okay, like an on-purpose secret baby. That's actually weirder. Here, there are two more secret babies, because it has now been revealed that he has twins with um, Siobhan Zillis, who is an executive at Neuralink, which is like, my god, what a PR nightmare, but also like- that, I, it's just scummy. It's just really scummy. Yeah, it's just, to get real for a second, it's not like this is a guy who understands power dynamics in the workplace or in life generally, and why it might be inappropriate to have a sexual relationship with somebody who directly reports to you. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, Elon Musk doesn't understand a lot of things. I doubt that he will understand- Consent, power dynamics. Well, I mean, we know he, according to- and a report from Business Insider, he allegedly does not understand consent because he allegedly propositioned a Tesla flight attendant and bribed her with a horse to do sex things. So like that happened. It's the bribe her with a horse part that I'm having trouble parsing. Yeah. Also the like not getting consent part, but you know. Well, no, see that part I was like, yeah, he's a horrible, powerful man. But the horse? Anyway. The horse. The horse. True. We'll trade horse for sex. So, a couple of facts here. First of all, I was actually looking through Elon Musk's kids, and he actually previously had a set of twins and a set of triplets. This is kind of an aside, but, like, that guy sure does end up making multiples. Yeah. That's, like, a lot of, like, twins, triplets for one man to simply be having. Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about science to say what that means. I did message our resident doctor, Emily Templewood, but I have not heard back. Yeah, because it was, like, 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning <laughs> for her. Of course she's asleep. I did text her at 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning being, like, Hey, do you think it's weird that Elon Musk has had both triplets and twins? You know, that's definitely not the weirdest message that she's gotten from us at like 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. But okay, so like the question that I have now, like aside from the actual serious shit, is that do you think Elon is good at hiding babies or is he very bad at hiding babies? See, that's the question is that on one hand, you can approach this as damn, in the past like two months, we found about three secret Elon babies. Or you can approach it and be like, we've well, only what if we've seen. Only. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is it only three or is it, oh, that's it. That's the full three. This is a genuine I question. Because, okay, so here's the thing. The pros and cons lists here. He's a very high profile individual who compulsively tweets everything. We'll get back to tweeting in a second. Put, putting a pin in that. On the other hand, he has a lot of money and resources to hide a baby if he wants to hide a baby. True. I mean, okay, I'm going to go on record. I'm going to go out on a whim. I feel like we should do a bet. Like, we have to make a bet. How would we ever... <laughs> Like, solve this bet. Okay, in the next year, if we find out about another Elon Musk baby, okay. I'm gonna bet there is another baby that we don't know about. Okay, then I guess I will bet against you and say that I think this is it. I am full of hope for the universe. I think this is the last Elon Musk baby. This does not count if he makes a new baby. <laughs> okay, it has to be a secret baby. It, it cannot be a fresh baby. <laughs> What's at stake in the bet here? Can it just be like... I'll buy you brunch. I don't know. I feel like we can't have too much at stake. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something that'd be funny, but I don't have anything funny. Yeah, fuck it. Brunch is at stake. I don't know. Kimbap from non tampopo place. Okay, so that's our bet. Let's shake hands through We're the We're shaking hands podcast. through the internet. For everyone at home, we are literally shaking our hands in front of the camera to really, you know, like consummate this. I shouldn't have said consummate. <laughs> July 9th, 2023, if we have not heard of another Elon Musk baby that was made in secret, then I am buying you brunch. And if we have heard, then I am buying you brunch. And this has to be an old baby, not a fresh baby. <laughs> <laughs> it cannot be a baby that is like, that comes out between now and then. Like, it's because then it's like, okay, sure, I guess. The baby has to already be born, baby like, has as of now. <laughs> baby, <laughs> life may begin at conception according to the Supreme Court, but not according to how I'm true. <laughs> God, I miss having rights. Yeah, it, it was really cool when the Supreme Court guaranteed me some rights to healthcare, but you know, uh, you know, it, it's fine. Everything's great. Um, speaking of things that are great, we have to continue talking about Elon Musk. This is devastating. <laughs> oh, actually, to backpedal for a second, we have to address the eugenics thing. So 
<laughs> Can we talk about I'm sorry about this man? It's like okay, the eugenics thing, the babies thing, the secret babies thing, the spoiler alert, the, the buying tw- Twitter thing, the horse. Like I hate that we talk about him so much, and I hate that this one man ha- has all of this going on. I do think society would be better if he was murdered. And now I'm going to get assassinated, just like former prime minister of Japan Shinzo Abe. On that note, you really found a way to weave that in. I was, you know, I had to do it because you know it's actually really fucked up that he got assassinated. But like, hey, claims to care about the birth rate dies anyway. Okay, say your thing. Say your <laughs> eugenics thing. Yeah, but but speaking about the birth rate, so for some reason, Elon Musk is very concerned about the birth rate in the U.S. dropping, which he is worried about, like, American births running out or something, which also he's South African, so that's like... (laughs) Well, he's doing his part by impregnating an American woman. Sorry, that was disgusting. (laughs) Like, he made a joke on Twitter, like, last month being like, I'm doing my part to help the American birth rate. Which is, uh, that's, a, that's not the creepiest thing he said, but it's like not great. It's not good. Yeah, which my takeaway is Elon Musk, we get it. You have sex. It's, it's, it has the same energy as like when Ben Shapiro was like, when he freaked out and was like, I have never made my wife like wet in my entire life. And we were all like, oh my god. No, you remember that, right? Where he was like on Twitter where he was like, actually, my wife is dry as fuck. He did not say that, but this was... I'm not even like paraphrasing that much. And everyone yeah. was like, so you've never aroused your wife. Why would you tell us this? I do vaguely remember this. And it's just always, it's so shocking to me how little people, like, I know that we talk about like, oh, these like Republican men, like they don't get to legislate on our bodies. But also it's like, they don't know shit. And that's because there is not good sex ed in the US. In this essay, I will. Truly, like, the only sex ed I had in school was like, here's pictures of STDs you don't want this and I was like yeah that's gross I don't want that oh I had like actual sex ed like you know like here's how to put a condom well that's that's yeah. because you went to private school in New Jersey and I went to public school in Florida Damn, I can't argue with that hey you know someone also stole the fake dick <laughs> oh no or like no not stole but I think broke and then stole like that that was the clear line of what had happened okay so did you have like the classic sex ed where it's like we're gonna put a condom on a banana um I don't think we ever did the banana but it was like here's a model of a dick like it, it was not like like a good model. It was just like a stick, right? And it was like, and here's putting the condom on it. And then that mul- that thing did get stolen, I think, one of the years I was in school, or like it got broken, and we all knew who did it, and we were all like, yeah, the fuck was that man doing? Yeah, I never learned how to put on a condom in like a formal way. Mm-hmm. Like, I-, I know how now, but like, I was never like taught this. <laughs> Amanda, like, I have sex and it is safe. <laughs> Yeah, me like Elon Musk. I have had sex before. Just gonna go on record and say it. Great. (laughs) Why is this episode so horny, but like in a rancid way? I know this is partially my fault. Okay, because Elon Musk is having secret babies and like then Radio Shack is just tweeting about squirting for some reason. And like, it's not our fault. Yeah, a real horny but bad week for everybody involved. Yeah, it's just, I think people just need to be like 20 times more chill about everything. But yeah, so Elon Musk is like, yeah, I'm gonna repopulate the earth. And it's like, bro, what are you doing? Like, why is this the hill you're gonna die on? Speaking of hills he's gonna die on. (laughs) What if you offered $44 billion to buy a social platform and then the stock market crashed and then you were like, haha, JK. And then you tried to get out of the deal. But then the social platform that you're trying to buy for $44 $44 billion dollars is like bro you like signed contracts and yeah so tldr now elon musk is like i'm not buying twitter but you can't like do that like it's just yeah you you can't just be like haha just kidding as somebody who is like literally one email away from being able to be called a lawyer so close i feel like i'm more excited about you being able to be called a lawyer than you are because i just really want to be on the podcast and be like lawyer but currently (laughs) isabel is not a lawyer despite having um received a jd passed the bar and work for a law firm passed bar sworn in and they just need to like tell me yeah cool we got your letter about being sworn in but they have not sent me that letter it's really exciting law is really exciting yeah so like your day job you know about mergers and acquisitions yes mergers and acquisitions is literally my job that's that's literally what I do at work. Yeah. And like you can't just say JK. Well, so here's the thing is you can say JK under some very limited circumstances. So is it actually interesting for us if I break down what's going on, like from the legal.jpg perspective? Yes, because that is our expertise. Oh my god, I'm an expert now, or I'm one piece of paper away from being an expert. Um, okay, so basically what Damn Elon- it, New York bar. 
Come on, New York Bar, third district, pull through. Um, okay, so what happened here is Elon did not say, haha, JK. What Elon did is he's basically sent a letter being like, there was material breach. And the way that this works is that material breach is one of the grounds under which you can terminate a contract if it's written in the contract that this is one of the grounds you can terminate on. That was very circular. To step back, right now we're between the sign and close period of the steal. And what this means is that the actual merger agreement has been hammered out. It has all of the, here's all the shit that happens. Here's what's actually getting traded. Here's what it's getting traded for. Here's what everyone's saying is cool and true about both companies. And here is the conditions under which one of us can be like, actually, just fucking kidding. And usually these are related to financing or they're related to... Like, if the government is like, no, no, you, you can't do that, then everyone gets off scot-free. Or not scot-free, whatever is in the agreement. But if you try to terminate the agreement outside of the bounds of these specific scenarios, then the other side can be like, um, no, actually, we are still doing this thing because it is not the specific scenario. Basically, what it's saying is that Musk was like, yeah, you didn't comply with the contractual obligations of the merger agreement, and you did not give me enough of the data that you said you'd give me, like fundamental data that I needed to like make decisions and to consummate the transactions. The funny thing about this, just from like a 10,000 foot like ironic perspective, is that Musk was also kind of like, I don't need to do any diligence. I don't need to look at any of Twitter stuff. We are just gonna sign this agreement. And that is actually an insane thing to do because in the usual transaction, what you have is a whole diligence period where everyone's like, let's investigate every single bit of this company. And Musk was like, no, no, no. Twitter, I know Twitter. We're good. We're fine. And now he's like trying to make this argument that like, I don't know Twitter and you're not letting me look at Twitter. And Twitter is being very much like, we are letting you look at Twitter. There is no material breach and you are being a little bitch. They gave him access to the quote unquote fire hose of data, which is just like all their data. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's, it's very much not an argument that is probably going to go through. And Twitter's board has been very much like, um, to quote Brett Taylor, Twitter's chairman. He and is that also a Salesforce guy. He's like from Salesforce. I did not know he was from Salesforce, but he basically tweeted that the Twitter board is committed to closing the transaction on the price and terms agreed upon with Mr. Musk and plans to pursue legal action to enforce a merger agreement. We are confident we will prevail in the Delaware Court of Chancery. And just context, Delaware Court of Chancery, that's where a lot of just like corporate legal battles are fought because everyone fucking like makes their thing in Delaware because Delaware is a tax haven. They're not a tax haven, but also, eh, eh, eh. And honestly, he's probably right because the only time the citation of like a material adverse effect, which is what Elon is saying, has succeeded in a Delaware court was like this one acquisition that happened in 2017. So Elon's argument to make something that was very boring, very short, Elon's argument is shit and he's shit. Yeah. And the 1 billion breakup clause is actually not that much. Hot take. Yeah. So basically like he has to pay a billion dollars if he breaks up the deal, which first he has mm -hmm. to like, as you said, he has to like actually be like a court has to say, yeah. Yes, Elon, you are right, which, like, he does seem low-key immune to the law, but also, like, he has been held to legal agreements before, for example, like, in his SEC agreement that has not been overturned, in which he has to have, like, a Twitter sitter, which is your dream job. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I've talked so much shit about him, but also... Would love to be Elon's Twitter sitter. Would be fascinating. Yeah, job. but then he might try to impregnate you. Yeah, so you know, <laughs> rethinking it now. TLDR, I just really want the internet to understand this does not mean that Elon Musk is not going to buy Twitter. This just means that there is going to be some more drama. Yeah, so realistically what's going to happen is they're going to duke it out and come to a settlement so that everyone's like egos can be soothed. And it's going to be more than a billion dollars, but it's going to be less than 44 billion, probably. Yeah. That's my crystal ball prediction. It may or may not be correct. If I'm not correct, I don't need to buy anyone brunch for it. <laughs> so my bet is I do think that Elon Musk is not going to buy Twitter, but I think it's going to be like a shit ton of drama before we get there. That's my guess right now. I'm torn because I I actually agree with you on this, but I think it's more fun to say, actually, I do think he's going to buy Twitter and it is going to be a shit ton of drama before he gets there. All right. Shake on it. We're shaking on it physically. Okay. Brunch two. Hey besties, it's Amanda. Welcome to the mid-roll, a thing we're doing now. Speaking of mid-rolls, I like when podcasts have a cute little mid-roll name, so please let us know if you have any ideas. The best I have is Craig's Corner, which I don't actually think is good, plus it presumes knowledge of an old podcast inside joke, and we don't want to be, like, exclusive or whatever, like, 
everyone's welcome. However, this does now give me an opportunity to tell you about the Wow of True Craig lore, if you're new. So before we get into the actual substance of this mid-roll break, let me tell you. The Craig we are referring to is indeed Craig Newmark, founder of Craigslist. And before I tell you the Craig lore, I did attend a conference at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism last week, which is just very funny because it's the Craig and he sponsors a journalism school at the City University of New York. And I went to a conference there and I took a picture with the sign that has his name on it and it wasn't weird. It was totally fine. I'm normal. Anyway. So, the Craig lore. We'll make this quick. You might remember Emily Templewood from our recent Ask an Extremely Online Doctor Anything episode, but she was originally such an early guest on the podcast that when we first recorded with her, we hadn't even announced we were making a podcast. So... Uh, She talked about how, as Wikipedian of the year, she became friends with Craig Newmark, who is Craig of Craigslist. He's a big donor to Wikipedia. It's a whole thing. And one time, Isabel was just at law school, and Craig Newmark was there for, like, doing a talk or something. And Emily was like, hey, you should go tell Craig I say hi. And Isabel was like, imagine me going up to Craig from Craigslist and being like, Emily Templewood says hi. Like, wouldn't that be awkward? Apparently it wouldn't be awkward because they're like actually friends. But anyway, long story short, we kind of just riffed on the idea that what if our only podcast listener was Craig from Craigslist since we hadn't released the podcast yet. And now people who listen to Wow of True are called Craigs because we are so cursed that we have managed to have an organically created fan base name despite being a small independent podcast. Speaking of being a small independent podcast, this is actually the reason why we're doing the mid-roll so we can like tell you about like stuff going on in the podcast. Anyway, Isabel and I are doing this out of the joy of making a podcast together with friends and the joy of building a community with you. But Things cost money, and we are currently funneling 100% of our Patreon contributions right back into the show by paying for podcast hosting, and most importantly, paying our delightful, perfect, incredible, excellent, I just know she's going to listen to this, editor, Allison, to make this show listenable. So truly, every single dollar we get from listeners on Patreon is directly helping make this show better. And every time we get a new patron, I get so excited. I get the little email. I text Isabel and go, woo! But you get far more than just our excitement. I think what's really exciting is that you get access to our Discord, which is extremely fun. It's patrons only. We have guests from the podcast just hanging out in there. You got Molly White from Web3 is going great, just like explaining weird scams in crypto to you just like in the discord not that she's like you know she's not required to she's just there for the goodness of our own heart so many guests so many fans so many amanda and isabel just all people that think that the internet is fun and cool and weird and like to talk about the internet being fun and cool and weird so come into the discord let's go from parasocial besties to actual internet besties and it'll be a fun time so That is at the $5 tier. At the $10 tier, you get a friendship bracelet, which I make with my own hands. Also forgot to say that at the $5 tier, you also get access to exclusive audio and video content that we sometimes make. But yeah, $10 tier, friendship bracelet. Absolutely huge. I will mail it to you, like, actually legit. This is a thing that we do, unless if you do not live in the U.S., because international shipping is difficult. And at the $15 tier, you also get access to our show notes that we use to prep and script and research for the podcast. And then there's also just a $69 tier, because, you know, maybe you really like us that much and really want to support our podcast. And honestly, we love you back. Fuck yeah, you rock. Okay, That's the end of our not-yet-named mid-roll. Maybe Craig's Corner, maybe not. Still think it's too insular of a joke, even though I just explained the joke. Anyway, back to the show. On the same day that this Elon Musk news broke, I also found out about uh, my problematic fave. He's not really problematic, but I just call him a problematic fave. My problematic fave, Hank Green. There was a a rumor going around TikTok that he stole a lemur from the zoo when he was 16. This is an equivalent crime to anything that Elon has done. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, so basically, like, I don't know if this is a legitimate photo or what, but basically this photo was going around of an article from 1996, which lines up, that is when Hank Green was 16, like, the real Hank Green. And it says, Boy steals lemur from Central Florida Zoo. Hank Green, 16, is believed to have hidden in the zoo since its closing with the intention of sneaking out the following morning. So then that went viral on TikTok and people were like, oh my god, Hank Green, the guy who teaches us about chemistry, stole a lemur from the Central Florida Zoo when he was 16. And then Hank had to be like, I'm sorry, I didn't actually- I did not steal- (laughs) And then he was basically like, guys, if I stole a lemur from the zoo, wouldn't I have talked about that extensively in my 15 years of being a creator on the internet? You know, that's actually a very compelling argument. Yeah, because there is like, in in Vlogbrothers lore, there is a story about something that Hank did in his youth that is too embarrassing to even be mentioned and that they're not allowed to talk about it. So people were like, so are you are you saying that this is, this is as they might say, lemur That's gate? what people were saying. Like when, before Hank addressed this, people were like, oh, this is the thing that they've been hiding for all this time. But I do agree with Hank's argument that he definitely would have talked about getting arrested for stealing a lemur. But maybe he was just embarrassed that he didn't get away with stealing the lemur. I also, I'm like, I kind of hope it was him because I think that's a funnier story. Yeah. Like, I wanted to have been Hank who stole a lemur, but I also want to know why anyone wants to steal a lemur. Yeah, I just thought it was very funny. Like, imagine you're Hank Green and your, like, PR person or whatever is like, Hank, we got to address the lemur situation. (laughs) No, the lemur situation. I thought I'd gotten away with it all these years. Also, Hank currently has COVID, which brings us to our next topic of discussion, which is, I went to VidCon. Hank Green went to VidCon, Hank Green got COVID, and I didn't because I wore a mask the entire time. And that's why you are superior to Hank Green. That and also, you've never tried to steal a lemur that I know of. Well, I don't think I've ever, like, touched a lemur, so. See, that doesn't answer (laughs) the stealing question. I have not stolen a lemur. But yes, okay, VidCon. Tell me about VidCon. What is VidCon? Because I did not know what VidCon was because I'm Craig who lives under a rock until you were telling me about VidCon. Okay, so VidCon was actually started by John and Hank Green in, like, like 10 years ago, maybe like before that. And it was the first online video conference that was just basically Mm -hmm. like YouTube fan conference. And over Mm -hmm. that time, it's evolved just into a much broader, like internet creators generally conference. And so like Mm -hmm. this year, actually, the primary sponsor was TikTok, not YouTube, which that was a thing. That was interesting. But yeah, basically, huge online video conference, like lots of like creator economy industry stuff that I write about. So I went and it was fun, except that the entire time I was like terrified that I was going to get COVID. But I did not knock on wood. I I mean, at this point, like if I had gotten COVID, I would have known. But yeah, cool. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions is whether this is like an industry thing or a fan thing. It's both. They have like different types of tickets you can buy. So If you're a Mm -hmm. fan, you buy, like, the community ticket, and then you just go to the, like, creator Mm -hmm. meets and greets, and, like, the expo hall with all the little, like, stands of all the people, and then, like, events where people are, like, performing in an entertaining way. And then there's a creator track, which is more, like, how do you figure out how YouTube analytics work? And then there's an industry track, which I did a panel on the industry track because I'm boring, where I, like, interviewed the president of a creator economy company about the creator economy. You know, casual. Mm -hmm. I do now have a cool picture of me on stage at VidCon looking like a girl boss, so. Hell fucking yeah. yeah. Who was the coolest person you met at VidCon? Um, I want to say V Spear. Okay. They're under the desk news on TikTok. Oh shit, yeah, okay, that's very cool. literally, I was supposed to interview them, but then we just ended up, like, hanging out, and then I didn't interview them. (laughs) So we can call that networking. It's just, like, really weird. The vibe at these things when you're a journalist is interesting because- the only people I knew were other journalists or people that I had interviewed. And then (laughs) honestly, okay, I can never go back to VidCon and not be on a panel because I had like the same badge access as the quote unquote featured creators because I was speaking on a Mm -hmm. panel. So I could just do whatever Mm -hmm. the fuck I wanted. Not, I mean, not actually, but like I had very wide reaching access. Okay, so what's the craziest thing you did? I was backstage at a SZA concert. Yeah, that's good. Which was weird because I had like attempted to interview V earlier that day, but then didn't because we were just like, 
it was like in a group of people. We were just sort of talking to a group of people that were all like cool and interesting. And then we didn't actually do the interview, but they were very cool. But then I ended up backstage at this is a concert, which I did not even realize I was going to be backstage, but they had these shuttles mm-hmm. that the shuttles were like bringing the featured creators around to places in such a way that they wouldn't be swarmed by fans. But then like, mm-hmm. I was able to use those shuttles because I had the badge, which was very funny because it mm-hmm. was just like all of these teens. You should have just pretended to be like a famous creator that people had. Well, didn't no, know it was about. really funny because at one point, like, also like the Anaheim Convention Center is massive and extremely hard to get around. So at one point, I mm-hmm. like I kept asking security guards, like, "Hey, how do I get to this place?" And then at one point, the security guard was like, "Well, do you need to know how to get there, like?" fast or do you need to know how to get there so that you won't get swarmed and i was like Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna get swarmed but i'm so flattered that you think that's even remotely a possibility well obviously you have this fucking like i don't know award-winning podcast that people so many people listen to. yeah of course (laughs) i did mention the podcast on stage at vidcon do you think that helped her in analytics um i don't know but we'll see we'll see so i was in this shuttle and they took me to the sisa concert And I thought I was just going to, like, be in the crowd. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, this is, like, backstage. And there's, like, a green room. And there's fancy snacks and drinks. And I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. Also, I was eating gelato. Like, like, the place I was coming from had gelato. So, of course, I had to get gelato. And then I just show up at this SZA concert, like with gelato i love the energy of you backstage of this is a concert eating gelato as if this is like totally chill and exactly what you were that expecting. that is truly what happened but yeah but then so i walk in and i don't know anyone but i like knew v because i tried to interview them and then so i was just like hey and i just like sat down and just like hung out and then like i was just like this is weird i feel like i'm bringing like weird fan energy but i truly just do not know anybody else here <laughs> you're valid i think that's fine they're very cool and i think that the work that they do is really important and good. I also, do you know Ghost Honey? Yes, I love Ghost Honey. I interviewed him and he was also very cool. Was he like his TikTok videos? Um, His TikTok videos are very like exaggerated, I think, which Mm -hmm. is normal, but he had incredible outfits. Like every day that I saw him, I was like, you look amazing. You know, that's actually, that's all I wanted to hear. Because I think what must be so weird about like cons like this is that like everyone has such a curated online personality. Yeah that I do think it would be very interesting to see these people walk around a convention center dying. Because, <laughs> like, you know, convention centers kind of suck for, like, a couple of days and, like, you know, just see how they act under that pressure. That was a really sociopathic thing for me to say, but I also think I'm I mean, right. I was running around the convention center dying, so... You know, and I bet our listeners want to see what you're, you're like at when you run around a convention no, center dying. like, it's- every day at this conference, I walked, like, 10,000 steps just, like, in the convention center. Yeah, Powerful. I was really getting a workout while I was stealing all of Snapchat's food because they had these, like, secret creator lounges that you had to have special privileges to get into, and Snapchat's was mm-hmm. by far the best because... One, it was, like, outdoors, but had, like, shade and fans and stuff, so it wasn't, like, horrible to be there. And then I felt less horrified about getting COVID because we were, like, sitting outside. And they had, like, catered lunch every day. And all Mm -hmm. of the other lounges had, like, muffins and bags of chips, which it's, like, that's not really a full meal, but but you can eat a lot of muffins if you want to be full. But I would prefer to eat the fancy Snapchat salads or the Beyond Burgers that they had. Oh my god, of course Snapchat had Beyond Burgers. Um, What's the coolest swag you Um, bought? Or like, what's the weirdest swag, actually? I'm changing my question. So Jelly Smack, who I moderated a panel for, in their fancy creator lounge, they were giving out Crocs. That's pretty good. Did they have like Jivets or was it just Crocs? And Fuck yes. But like... I honestly, like, I I don't know if I should take the gibbets out of my Crocs because I genuinely, I really like these Crocs. They're very comfortable. Also, now I'm like, if I write about Jelly Smack, (laughs) do I have to do a disclosure and be like, Jelly Smack gave me Crocs? I think you do, but only because it's funny. Which, to be fair, like, I don't think it's journalistically unethical to, like, get swag at an event. I think it's unethical if Jelly Smack, like, had flown me out there, which they did not. Yeah, so I got Crocs. And one of the gibbets I got is, like, a red wine glass, and it is literally the chuggiest object one has ever seen. So I'm guessing you love it then. (laughs) Yes, but also the thing is, is that, like, I don't really like red wine. For some reason, the way that you said that was just an incredibly chuggy way of saying that, as if it was, like, some sort of dark (laughs) secret. 
that you like don't like red wine like that's fine red wine makes my head hurt and white wine doesn't i don't know why that is they're both simply just grapes but hey i mean red wine i think has more tannins so that might be what it is um this is great content this is what the people are here for for us to talk about the tannins we're a sommelier podcast (laughs) welcome to wild true the podcast of your wildest wines The podcast of your sommelier dreams. The podcast of your um, vineyard vines. That was nothing. What other questions do you have for me? Did you ever have a situation where you were talking to someone and they expected you to know who they were? Because what I was, one of the things I was thinking about for VidCon is that there's so many goddamn internet creators who are only famous to a segment of the population, but it's a pretty big segment. But if you're not in that segment, you won't know who they are. I mean, I feel like people, at least the people I talked to, they weren't like, don't you know who I am? But, mm-hmm. oh, I did see Charlie D'Amelio in the flesh. Okay. So there was a press room and the press room was simply just like a bunch of tables and they did have muffins. Thank you to those press room muffins, which were my breakfast. And you would think that Charlie D'Amelio would avoid the press room at all costs, but she simply just went in there. And then I had a weird ethical conundrum where I was like, should I try to go talk to her for journalism reasons? But I was also like, she's literally a teenager and she's probably overwhelmed. And that's probably why she like went into this room and she probably wants to be left alone. Also, she was like with her dad and she had like an entourage around her and they were like brushing her hair. Like she was just like standing there and they were like brushing her hair because she was doing photos and like, it was a whole thing. I don't know. That sounds really unpleasant actually. Yeah, I mean, it was just like, there's, there's certain people that when they get to a certain level of celebrity, they have such good stylists that they just don't look real like she did not look like a real person oh that's freaky because like charlie d'amelio is like she was just like some guy until she became tiktok famous right like that's the arc of charlie d'amelio like yeah did you ever run into anyone who was very like don't you know who i am but you had no idea who they are um no but there there were people that i saw like getting swarmed and i was like i don't know who you are like people were super pumped about the dream smp panel god of fucking course there's a dream smp panel i do know about people dream smp were freaking the fuck out about like minecraft yo minecraft youtube is huge yeah fucking people are insane about minecraft youtube people have written so much fan fiction about minecraft youtubers i did get one of those shuttles with a group of roblox youtubers that were apparently Apparently very famous, but I didn't know who they were. They're called like crew, I think, like K R E W. That's tracks to me, but I don't know enough about Roblox. To say. I don't under- actually understand Roblox, which is one of like the more like millennial things I guess I've said on me this too. Podcast. I don't understand Roblox either, which yeah, I'm a millennial. It's fine, but they all had colored hair and they all just looked so like they were truly styled as a unit. Very boy band energy. Truly, except it here. was Roblox YouTubers. And then I had another, (laughs) honestly, like getting to ride around on this shuttle was just like, I just met the weirdest people that I didn't know who they were, but I was just like, this is very funny. And then I I did like, I shared a car with a bunch of like literal teenage TikTokers. And then I decided to just like talk to them and be like, hey, I'm a journalist. Like, what do you think I should be paying attention to? Is there anything that you wish a journalist knew about? Just sort of trying to like get Mm -hmm. the tea from these teenage famous TikTokers. And then they told me some stuff. And then I wanted to give them my card to be like, hey, like, if you Mm -hmm. ever want to, like, give me any information or whatever, or you want to, like, tell a journalist something, like, here's my card. And then I was like, oh, my God, I cannot give Gen Z my card. Why not? Because they're Gen Z. They don't do cards. They do, like... TikToks. I don't know. They don't have business cards. You can still give them your card. It'll be a novelty for them. It's fine. <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's like a relic of the past if you give Gen Z TikTokers your card. Like, honestly, I think they would remember that. I think that would be yeah, novel for them. The last thing I'll say about these shuttles is that um, I did have a, an awkward interaction where there was like a couple behind me and people kept coming up to them and being like, oh my God, like, I love you guys. Then the guy said something where he was like, oh yeah, like I ran into like Rachel uh, from the show. And then I was like, I turned around and I'm a big fan of the circle. And I turned around and I'm like, oh, it's mm. Brew from the circle. And <laughs> I said to him, I just realized who you are. <laughs> That's like, actually, I feel like you just negged. <laughs> I feel like that was, like, nagging. <laughs> no. Well, then, like, because his, his girlfriend is, like, Instagram famous, and she was very nice. Like, she right. was just like, oh, like, how are you doing? Like, oh, you have the speaker badge. What was your panel about? How did it go? Like, she, like, definitely diffused it, where I was just like, oh, 
I, I know who you are. And I, I wasn't like, oh, like, I love the circle, which that would have, like, probably been a nice thing to say. Just to be like, as opposed to just, oh, it's like, oh, you exist. <laughs> that, that feels like a weird sort of nagging. It's like, I didn't recognize you at first, but now I know. And I have nothing good to say about yeah, you. I, which, no, like, I mean, I think he was good on the circle. I like the circle. Justice for Brew. I don't know. But that that happened. So that's that's my, uh, my VidCon experience. So hearing about this, now I'm like, should we try to become famous again? Should we try to become internet famous? Yes. You're raising your hand. But also, the one last thing I will say is I interviewed a VTuber, but the VTuber was a person. That's all VTubers are people. I know, but it's like... Why would you say it like this? What what, what did you think was behind the VTuber? It was just like weird because I was on the phone with her manager and he was like, oh yeah, she's like in the hotel lobby. And I'm like, I don't know what she looks like. I just like, I only know what the VTuber looks like. Sh- should we try to become VTubers? Maybe, maybe. I think I would do a pretty good job as a YouTuber. I think you would too. I think I could fucking crush yeah. it. And on that note... On that note, send in your recommendations for what my VTube Sona should be. Yeah. If you like this episode, tell a friend. Word of mouth is how we grow. Thank you to all of our patrons and shout out specifically to Zoe Bray, Andre Thea, Brian, and Gabriel. If you want your name in the above or in our Twitter header, slide right into our Patreon at patreon.com slash wowftrue. Shout out to Allison Mills, beloved audio editor, and to graphic designer and Canva warlock Eric Silver, who made our logo. And last, to Sam Reiser, who who made our podcast music. You can find us on Twitter as at WowFTruePod and Instagram and Facebook as at WowFTru. Had your 15 seconds of internet fame? Slide right into our Twitter DMs and tell us about it. Were you at VidCon? Did you see Amanda? To also tell us about that. Until next time, let's get weird on the internet. Woo!